Who's going to come and join me? No, that's all right. I'll just be here on my own. Because actually my, my um, story I want to tell tonight is a little bit about that, about being on your own a wee bit. So have you ever been at, like at school, and some of your older kids will identify with this as well, when you are, you're at school and someone says, we're going to put together a team, and so all the children, oh, I see, I knew you would come. They, they line you up and you go two lines and then they get two of the coolest kids usually, the most athletic, and they go, now choose your team. Okay, have you ever been in that situation? And you've got to choose who, who you want to be on your team and you get to go, the, each person gets to go one each. Well, when I was at high school particularly, I was, I could run fast, but that was about it. I couldn't catch the ball very well and, and that kind of thing. So my experience was inevitably when I was at school, when they were choosing teams, who do you want to be on your team? Guess what would happen to me? Do you think I'd get chosen first? No. What do you think would happen? Yeah, no one would choose me. Yeah. Well, I'd have to get chosen eventually because the teacher would say, come on, you've got to choose... And so I would often be the last me and a couple of other kids. And it was always a, a bit of a stink feeling that to be sort of left out and, and nobody would want you in, in your team. Well, tonight, one of the things that we're going to be talking about is the fact that God has chosen a team. Do you know that? God's chosen a team. Do you know about God's team? Do you hear that? Yeah. So God's chosen a team. So how do you think you get to be in God's team? Who do you think God is looking for to be on his team? You think he's looking for all the cool, cool dudes? All the athletics? All the good-looking people? He's looking for Christians. Now, so, so tell me, what is it, how, do, how do you get to be a Christian to be on God's team? Do you have to be a really, really good person? You have to believe in him. That's right. And you know what the Bible tells us is that God chooses people who, um, when, when he chooses them, he doesn't choose them because they're his friends or because they're cool or because they're good. He chooses them actually because they're often his enemies. Isn't that weird, eh? He chooses them because they're a long way away. They're like, I don't want to believe in God. I don't want to have God in my life. But God chooses them. God redeems them. They cry out to God for mercy. And they're like, God, I really suck. I'm no good. I, I, I can't be on your team, but please and God says, yes, I choose you to be on my team. And of course, what's God's team called? Yeah? God's it is God's team. We could change the name. It's called the church, okay? God's team is called the church. And so tonight we're going to be talking about and looking at a psalm, Psalm 107, that tells us about how we get to be in God's team and the kinds of people that God chooses to be in his team. So I hope you listen up on that one, but let's pray, shall we? Lord, we thank you that you invite all to yourself. And we remember our Lord Jesus Christ, who said, let the little children come to me and do not stop them for of such is the kingdom of God. Lord, we know that in order to be a part of your team, we have to be as children in our faith towards you. We have to come with that simple faith, that trusting attitude. We thank you that you choose us to be on your team, not because we're cool, not because we're strong, not because we're brainy or anything like that, but you choose us because you have mercy on sinners and you are kind and gracious. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, tonight we're going to be turning to Psalm 107. And uh, we kind of are coming towards the end of a journey through the Psalms. It was supposed to be Jeff Bustich tonight, but of course he's uh, isolating. Uh, but he'll be back with us, God willing, next Sunday. And uh, tonight, <clears throat> in terms of theological overview, this is a Psalm that draws our attention to what it means to be a part of God's covenant community, to be a part of the church, to be a part of the family of God, or as this um, describes it here, a part of the redeemed. 
So let's read this psalm together. Psalm 107 from verse 1. Listen to God's word. I give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. Some was wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their souls fainted within them, and they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of men. For he satisfies the longing soul and the hungry soul he fills with good things. Some sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in affliction and in irons, for they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. So he bowed their hearts down with hard labor and they fell down with none to help. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and burst their bonds apart. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of men. For he shatters the doors of bronze and cuts in two the bars of iron. Some were fools through their sinful ways, and because of their iniquity suffered affliction. They loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of men, and let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his deeds and songs of joy. Some went down to sea in ships Doing business in the great waters, they saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to the heaven. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wits' end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of men. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. He turns rivers into a desert and springs of water into thirsty ground, a fruitful land into a salty waste because of the evil of its inhabitants. He turns a desert into pools of water and parched land into springs of water, and there he lets the hungry dwell. And they establish a city to live in. They sow fields and plant vineyards and get fruitful yield. By his blessing they multiply greatly. He does not let their livestock diminish. When they are diminished and brought low through oppression, evil, and sorrow, he pours contempt on princes and makes them wander in trackless wastes. But he raises up the needy out of affliction and makes their families like flocks. The upright see it and are glad, and all wickedness shuts its mouth. Whoever is wise, let him attend to these things. Let them consider the steadfast love of the Lord. Amen, and may God bless to us that reading of his word. Let us pray. Lord God, we have gathered here as those who have been redeemed, and as we consider the psalm, we pray that by your spirit you would guide us to see ourselves in the truth of your word. Lord, we pray that we would count ourselves among those who are redeemed. And if we are here tonight and we don't know what it means to be redeemed, we don't know what it means to be saved, what it means to be delivered, what it means to cry out to God and 
Give praise and thanks for deliverance. Send your Holy Spirit into our hearts. Reveal Christ to us, we pray. In his name, amen. I remember a um, an experience I had when I was had been a Christian for not very long. I was just a baby Christian, and I was driving along in a car with some friends out in the countryside somewhere, just looking out the window, not really focused on anything that was happening outside. But I was reflecting internally on what it meant that now that I was a Christian, because for me it was. It had come as a shock to me. It was not part of my plan. I had always thought that I would become a Christian when I had become older and more boring, preferably around the age of 50. And uh, I'd had all the fun that life had to offer me. But God in his mercy had drawn me to himself. And I was, as I was driving along and I was thinking about, well, you're a Christian now, Jeff. What? What does this mean? And I was struck by this thought that I am now a Christian and I'm now part of a whole new family. I now am a part of a whole people who belong together, who are united together. Once I was outside of this family and now I am part of this family. And, and, and I, I just remember that thought being really awed and and quite profoundly moved by that thought that I belong to a people and this was a belonging that would go on forever. It was an eternal belonging. It was something that would never change. Whatever the circumstances were, whatever stupid things I might do or what may happen in the external world around me and in my family or anything like that, this would never change. I belong. In other words, I realized I was part of the church. Now, it's something that often we do take for granted, don't we? If you, especially if you grow up in the church, if you've been born and raised in a church family, it can be something that you take for granted. You think, well, yeah, church. And in fact, sometimes we can be quite critical and, and, and harsh towards the church. And we, we're quick to point out all the faults, you know, of, of the church. So, oh, the, the, the music or the singing in that church is not very good, or the preacher is boring, or they use the wrong Bible, or the seats are too hard, or the, you know, the, the hasn't got a roof on it, you know, or whatever it is. We, we can easily find points to complain and, and to criticize, and we miss out on the, the sheer joy and, and rejoicing and celebration that this psalm expresses that when you are a believer, when you are someone who has been rescued and set free by God, you are part of a new family. You have been redeemed by God. Now, we know that if you read through the Old Testament, this, this is a, when it talks about the redeemed, it often will use this term, the assembly or the congregation, the kahal, the called out, the Hebrew term is. And in the New Testament, of course, it's the ecclesia, the, the same thing, the church or the, the assembly. And of course, there's only ever been one church throughout God's plan of sal- uh, re- salvation and God's plan of redemption. And it's interesting that we read from Exodus chapter 12, where we see that God institutes the sign of inclusion into his family, which is circumcision, and the seal of that is the Passover. And under the new covenant, of course, it's baptism and the Lord's Supper that includes us and and, and brings us into his family. But we realize that those are only outward signs and seals. In actual fact, of course, the way we come to be a part of God's family, a part of God's church, a part of the redeemed, is by calling upon and crying out to God and him hearing us and rescuing us and bringing us into his family into the company of the redeemed. So this is this psalm, I believe, gives expression <clears throat> to that. And it does it really by, by two ways. There's sort of three sections to the psalm. He starts out by expressing this thankfulness for being a part of, of God's um, redeemed community. And then he talks about how it is that the different ones come to be. How is it that, and he gives four different Um, stories or four different categories or four different experiences, if you will, of how it is that these people came to be a part of God's redeemed 
And then at the end, he goes on to express that joyfulness and, and how we should respond to that. So in verses 1 and 3, he expresses, what it, um, he expresses who these redeemed are. This, this joy that we have, he says, O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, who he redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands and from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. So what he's immediately doing is saying, if you're a Christian today, your attitude and your heart should be one of thankfulness and of gratefulness because you recognize that what God has done for you, what God has, has um, put on for you, if you will. You notice it talks here about, he says, give thanks for his steadfast love. And it's an, a steadfast love that is eternal. This, this is a Hebrew term which is chesed which means a, a loyal love, an enduring love, a love that will never be taken away. And it's a love that God shows towards his people. And the other amazing thing is when you read those words is that if you think of an Old Testament Jew um, reading through particularly uh, verse 3, where he talks about those who are the redeemed and, and who it is that has been redeemed, he says they've been gathered from the lands. Now, some scholars and some commentators say, well, these are the people coming back from the exile from Babylon or other places where they've been carried away. But I actually think this is, is older than that and is expressing God's actual promises and what he's doing in the likes of, of people um, like, you know, the uh, Ruths and um, the, the, those who God has rescued out of out of uh, the nations around them, and of course the promise that what would happen once God had brought the Gentiles to himself from east and from west and from north and from south. And of course this is true of the church, isn't it, today? Even as we look around us and we think, you know, what do I have in common with that person? Where did I, where did I meet him or where did I meet her? Well, I met them at church. Would I have met them anywhere else? Probably not because my, our social circles are different, our, our work is a different kind of work context. Sometimes I'll, I think of the church as kind of like a bag of mixed veggies. No, no uh, offense to any of you, I'm not saying you're, you're like mixed veggies, but kind of like a bag of mixed veggies. Isn't it? We're all different shapes and sizes and colors, but we're all, part of the, we're all in the same bag and we're all in the same freezer together. We're all part of the same church and we're part of God's grand work of salvation together. From north, south, east, and west, God brings us together. We're all one in Christ Jesus. And we all come with different stories. And that's the second part. This is what the bulk of the psalm is about. Here we see four, um, in verses 4 to 32, four different stories of how it is that, that the redeemed come to be a part of God's people. He talks about the wanderers being retrieved. He talks about the prisoners being released. He talks about the sick being restored. And he talks about the storm-tossed being rescued. And I want to encourage you tonight, as you read through those words and as you think about it, maybe you find yourself in one of those or, or two of them or maybe all of those kinds of scenarios that the psalm writer describes here. In verses 4 to 9, he talks about the wanderers who are retrieved. He says, some wandered in desert wastes, finding, this is verse 4, no way to a city to dwell in hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within in them. And then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them. Verse 6 is a refrain, then they cried out to the Lord. You'll see that happens four times throughout this, this psalm as it describes how they came to be the Lord's people. And, and I think what's been described here is something that maybe you have experienced. It's a place of, of, of spiritual desert. It's a, it's a spiritual condition that you find yourself in wandering from God. Maybe you've just you've put your Bible in a way and you haven't picked it up and you haven't read it for months on end. Or you haven't even sp spent a moment to pray and to seek God's face. Or maybe you haven't been to church for, for weeks on end. And, and so you feel like you're wandering from God or you've neglected fellowshipping with God's people. And in a sense, you're like a, you're spiritually homeless and spiritually hungry. You're lost and you're desperate. 
and there's nowhere to call home. And in fact, it gets pretty desperate. It gets pretty dire, doesn't it? He says their soul is fainting within them. What is happening? Spiritually, we start to what? We start to die, don't we? We start to shrivel up when we neglect fellowship and, and what we call the means of grace, being with God's people, the reading of the word, prayer. And so we cry to God and he delivers us. He puts our feet on a rock. He establishes our way. And back amongst God's people is like being in a city after being out in the wop wop somewhere. They cried to the Lord, verse 6, verse 7. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of men, for he satisfies the longing soul. If you've ever wandered spiritually, if you've ever been away, if you were in that place, you know what, it like, what it's like to come back into fellowship with God and have your soul restored, to be fed again, to be nourished. And now, now your hunger is satisfied and you have all the nourishment, brothers and sisters, we have all the nourishment that we will ever need this side of death. Or maybe you're like the prisoner released. He says, verse 10, Some, though, sat in darkness in the shadow of death, prisoners in affliction and irons, for they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. So he bowed their hearts down with hard labor, and they fell down with none to help. These are the prisoners. These are the oppressed. These are those who are chained. And sometimes when God rescues a person and brings them to himself, he finds them in a place where they are like spiritual prisoners spirit and spiritual bondage. We find ourselves in dark places. We find ourselves facing death without any hope. It's a terrible condition to be in. To find your, your, your life ebbing away or to find yourself in danger or to find yourself lying in bed at night and worrying and thinking, what will happen to me when I die? And you, there's no hope for you there. There's only darkness. There's only despair. There's only a, a blackness beyond this life. And so in desperation, having rebelled against God's word, verse 11, they rebelled against the word of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. Maybe you've done that. Maybe you've lived your life like that. You've heard the gospel and you're like, yeah, nah. Maybe you're like me. It's like, yeah, wait till I'm a bit older when I'm ready. God and my time. Then I'll, I will do something about it. Maybe you were in that condition. But finally, in desperation, knowing that you were dying, you cried out to the Lord. Nowhere else to turn. And the words of amazing grace come true for you. My chains fell off. My heart was set free. And from darkness to life. And there are all kinds of things that we can be bound by in life. You know, there are some things that are obvious. Maybe it's a drug addiction. Maybe it's alcohol addiction. Maybe it's sex addiction. Maybe it's those things that are less obvious. Things like work addictions. Or, or sporting addiction, or shopping, things that bind us, and we, we, we are, are chasing these things, and they, we think they're going to give us satisfaction in life, but they never do. They just bind us up more and more and more, and we lose hope. But then there's another category here he talks about in verse 17. Some were fools through their sinful ways. And because of their iniquity suffered affliction, they loathed any kind of food. They drew near to the gates of death, and they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. Maybe you just couldn't stand God. Maybe you just thought, yeah, Christians are just weirdos. I remember thinking that. Christians are just weirdos. I don't want to be a Christian. Why would I want to be like one of them? Look at them. They wear Roman sandals. You know, these Christians. Maybe that, that was our attitude, an attitude of, of pride and rebellion, fools through our own sinful ways. 
And the result of our folly, of course, is, is sickness and you become burdened by your own sinfulness. You know, you thought, oh, I'm going to go and have a wonderful life without God. How did that work out for you? Wonderful life without God. It doesn't, does it? It only ends in despair. It only ends in sickness. And you knew where you were headed and you cried out to God. Notice how it says here how God delivers. Verse 19, they cried to the Lord in trouble. He delivered them from the distress. What did he do? Verse 20, he sent his word and healed them. What a wonderful picture that is. God sends his word. And suddenly the words that you spurn, you thought, yeah, I'm not into that Christianity. I don't want to be one of them. Suddenly God's word becomes your very lifeline. And it's your hope. And it points you back to your creator. And then there's this final category. There's the storm tossed. This is an interesting one. Some went down, verse 23, to sea in ships doing business in the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord as wondrous deeds. Uh, sorry, his wondrous works in the deep. This is interesting because this is kind of like, well, yeah, it's is like sailing and kayaking and boating. Is that bad? Should you not do that? Or should you not do business? No, this is just the stuff of life, isn't it? This is stuff that we all do. Things that every one of us, every day we have to do this kind of stuff. But what seems to happen, what seems to be going on here is that these are people you might say are living very successful lives. You might say life is going swimmingly, excuse the pun, but life is going well. Everything is feeling good. Everything's falling into place. You've got the right home. You've got the right job. You've got the right car. Kids are in the right school, whatever it is. And you think, man, my life is so blessed. And, and they even see wonderful things that God provides them with and, and God makes to work out in your life. And you think, wow, how did that happen? Man, that's amazing that God was, that, that this happened in my life. He says in verse 24, they see the deeds of Yahweh. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. But then God does something. He blesses them with a storm. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to the heavens. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men. <laughs> That's just being in a storm, isn't it? You've been on the Cook Strait Ferry in the storm. Everybody's reeling and staggering like drunks. But this is what happens when God comes and upsets our lives. We, we start to we're disorientated. God maybe blesses you with the loss of a job or a, a sick child or a divorce or some other shock that just seems to upend your life and you think this is a disaster. What is happening to me? Why does God hate me so much? Why is God doing this to me? Well, what God is doing is he's showing mercy to you and he's bringing you back to your senses and he's bringing you to himself reeling and staggering in shock verse 27 verse 28 they cried out to the lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress you cried out to god what i love about these verses they cried out to the lord in their trouble he delivered them from their distress he made the storm be still and the waves of the sea were hushed and they were glad the waters were quiet and he brought them to their desired haven I just love how this reminds us of our Lord Jesus Christ. You remember in Matthew 8, Jesus and the disciples crossing the lake and the storm comes and they, Jesus is asleep. He's like totally chilled. And they wake him up and they say, Lord, don't you care that we're perishing? And Jesus gets up and does what? He stills the storm and he hushes the waves. And the disciples say, what kind of person is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? And they come to the other side of the lake in peace. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what he 
has done for you. If you're a Christian, if you're a part of God's redeemed, if you're part of the congregation, if you're one who can sing praises to God, that's because a man called Jesus has come and stilled the storm in your life and brought you to the other side in awe and amazement at this. You trust in him and devote your life to him. And so then you come to the final part of the psalm, verses 32 to 43 which says, let them extol him in the congregation of the people let, and praise him in the assembly of the elders <clears throat> and goes on to describe God's blessings. You know, sin, sin and rebellion against God brought his wrath and curse on the world and on creation and on us. But instead, as those who are a part of this world and who have cried out to God in our distress, we are in a different place. Have you, have you not thought about that as a Christian? You live in a world that is, is, is totally infected by sin. You live in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in amongst the people whose hearts are, are by nature corrupted and nobody does anything out of a pure motive. And yet your eyes and your sight and your heart is, is committed to a, a, a family and to a community who are intent on Christ and on glorifying God in Christ Jesus. You see, we gather as the redeemed of the Lord. This is what it means to be the church. We gather as the redeemed of the Lord who have experienced his steadfast love. We have found ourselves in that place where we're distressed and we have cried out to God. This, this is a definition of what a Christian is. Somebody who was lost and perishing and cries out to God and God has come and rescued them and delivered them. And so in verse 32, we delight to sing, to extol him in the, in the congregation. The desert is gone. Verse 33, he turns rivers into desert. God can do that and springs water into thirsty ground and fruitful land. But verse 35, he turns the desert into pools of water and parched land into springs of water. And there he lets the hungry dwell and they establish a city to live in. They sow fields and plant vineyards and get a fruitful yield. By his blessing, they multiply greatly and he does not let their livestock diminish. This is what it means to be a part of the church. This is what it means to be a part of the redeemed. God brings you from a place of lostness. God brings you and I from, from a place of despair and death and, and, and barrenness and, and desert wilderness places. And he brings you into the company of the redeemed, into the city of God, into the church of Christ, where his blessing resides. This is the church. And this is the place where Christ alone rules, not other princes, not kings, not governments. This is where the, all are welcomed and the lonely have a family. This is the church. And so the psalm finishes by inviting us and challenging us. Verse 43, whoever is wise, let him attend to these things and let them consider the steadfast love of the Lord. In other words, don't neglect, don't abandon, don't forget what it means to be a Christian and, and the blessing of what it is to be a part of his church, to be a part of his family, to be a, a, a person who once was lost and perishing, but now belongs to God's people. So you're in a good place tonight. It's good. It's a good place to be. It's a good to be a part of the church. It's, it's a good thing to gather with God's people. And, and the only thing that we need to understand is that we, we're here not because of what we might do or what we have to offer God, or we're not here in order to earn a place with God or to get into God's good books, but we are here, as the psalm describes, because we cried out to the Lord and he heard you and he delivered you. That's... That's the blessing. That's the, that's the encouragement that the psalm gives you. Because you cried out to the Lord, he delivered you from your distress. And he brought you into his family and to be a part of his church. So that you can say, in the words of the psalm, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. It's a blessing, isn't it? It's a wonderful thing. 
to be a part of the redeemed, to be a part of God's family, to be a part of the church where we experience day by day God's mercy and kindness to us. Let's pray. Lord, we want to confess before you tonight that it's very easy for us to be cold or neglectful about your church. And we thank you for the psalm which challenges us to reevaluate how we think about your church and how we consider what it means to be a part of the people of God. There is nothing ordinary in this psalm to being a part of your people. But there is only tragedy and rescue. And Lord, that really sums up our lives. We were in distress. We cried out to you. You heard our cries and you delivered us. And we are here. Lord, Help us to always remember that. Help us to, uh, in the words, as this psalm expresses, to be a part of those who come in the congregation and give praise and thanks to you for your steadfast love. Lord, we do this tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.